And I just want to um, mention a, a data set I'm really looking forward to the results of, which is the Solar One data, which I hope will be presented at either ESMO in October or San Antonio in December this year, uh, which is the uh, second line uh, therapy in ER positive metastatic of fulvestrant with or without the you kind of alpha specific PI3 kinase inhibitor, um, alpelacid. And, you know, PFS is the endpoint. Um, and it is um, looking at patients with PIK3CA mutations and then a cohort that doesn't have PIK3CA. Yeah. But I think, uh, I believe it's co primary endpoint. But anyway, there's a, it will be analyzed in a substantial number of patients that have PIK3CA mutations. So fingers, fingers crossed, because that would be fabulous. And I've been had the opportunity to use that in some patients, either as a single patient IND or on clinical trials. And I, I am impressed. I have a patient right now, she's a 20 year a metastatic breast cancer survivor, just one of the, a serial responder, and she's too numerous to count prior regimens. She's been on everything twice, and she's having a major response to alpelacid with fulvestrin, even though she's had fulvestrin twice before. Um, late line liver, lung, so I'm impressed. Yeah, I, 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 I hope that this Sandpiper trial doesn't dampen uh, enthusiasm for PI3 kinase inhibition. I don't think it will because we're other agents are very far along in their development, but um, this will certainly change the landscape for sure. Yeah, that was um, the, that was the, the tasolicib, you know, just at, at ASCO, yeah. big phase three trial, and um, with fulvestrin plus minus tasolicib again, a um, the tasolicib they called it beta sparing. It wasn't just alpha specific. It had a little bit more of PI3 kinase, you know, isoform inhibition, but but spared. Beta, but it was a little. It was too toxic. Unfortunately, was the problem. It met its primary endpoint, but it was it was too too toxic, and the improvement in PFS wasn't huge enough, you know, to make up for that toxicity. Yeah, and I, and I definitely I, I know we're going to dig into this subject more when we talk about some novel oral chemotherapeutics. But for for our working group, one of the things that we really um, did a deep dive in was the this balance between. <clears throat> incremental improvement in PFS and toxicity and what cost patients are paying for um, a PFS advantage in terms of toxicity. And there, very are, there aren't that many great metrics that help gauge that balance. Um, so it's just something to keep, keep the eye on the ball. But um, Dr. Baselga presented a statistically positive trial that will never lead to a, 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 an actionable, usable regimen. Yes, yes. Um, and so we'll keep our keep our fingers um, crossed on on that. And you know, Andy, I want to um, get your your thoughts. Another agent we haven't had a chance to use that much, at least speaking for myself, but I look forward to is the is the PARP inhibitor for the yeah. for the right patient. Any experience with olaparib? So yeah. Far so so this is the opposite. Um, you know, I, we just talked about getting a PFS advantage, and having a, a significant price to pay in terms of toxicity for that. So you know, my colleague Mark Robson. Uh, reported the Olympiad trial, where olaparib, um, when compared to um, treatment of physician's choice, which were chemotherapeutic agents in patients with germline BRCA mutations and metastatic breast cancer, um, not only prolonged PFS, but had a toxicity profile that was similar, if not in many ways favorable to, to chemotherapy. So um, with perhaps the exception of some anemia, um, fatigue, um, for me, this was an example of having your cake and eating it too. You know, getting getting more longer disease control and not paying a price in terms of excessive toxicity. So um, I can't say I've had that many patients thus far with germline BRCA mutations um, and ER positive breast cancer, mm -hmm. where I'm trying to see how how where should I think about playing the elaborate card related to endocrine therapies. And but certainly when I'm starting to think about it as an alternative to chemotherapy, it it rises to the top. Yes, and it, it certainly has driven us now to uh, make sure we have germline status on our metastatic patients. The NCCN guidelines, I was very, I wanted to give them a round of applause. I was surprised, but very pleased to see the NCCN change their guidelines to say, get germline BRCA status on all metastatic breast cancer patients that are HER2 negative, that are HER2 negative, that would have been eligible for the, um, the Olympi, the Olympiad trial, right. and then the Embraca trial will probably have tassili um, the um, talizoprib, you know, the other oral yeah, yeah. PARP inhibitor will also be, that was you know a very positive trial as well, and so that will no doubt be uh, available. 
to, from FDA approval very soon. Yeah, I mean, it, if you don't know, you can't do, right? right. So, right. so um, and it's not, it's not natural for docs to think about germline testing for treatment selection for metastatic breast cancer. You do germline testing to decide about prophylactic mastectomy and oophorectomy. Um, so this is a whole nother. It, yes. Home. And I must say, I'm still working to get it into the to, into the hard drive, into the flow in clinic. You know, remember, oh goodness. Right, and I guess this know? makes it reimbursable, perhaps, right? If yes. You're, if you're doing it for that reason. Right. Exactly. Right. right. It's on the NCCN guidelines yep. now for help. But I um I would use Olaparib, uh, basically as as soon as I could. In in other words, if I have a patient now with a known germline BRCA one or two, and she's been getting whatever therapy, and she's ER positive. Once she's finished endocrine therapy options, that's personally where I would probably bring it in. You know, before I would go to capecitabine, I would, or right after, I guess, you know, um, I guess in the, um, both the Olympiad and the um, and BRCA trial patients had had some prior chemotherapy, so you could certainly use it after uh, chemotherapy. But if a woman, I think ideally, um, I would probably transition it after endocrine therapy, although one could use it after CDK. Four six right. um, inhibitor therapy, for example, before yeah. going on to another endocrine agent or mTOR inhibition. So, but as soon as possible, um, I'm remembering the um, the Olympiad data set. There was an update of the data at AACR this year, and it looked at patients that were receiving the um, the Olaparib um, in the first line setting because they had had prior chemotherapy, and of course it was um, HER2 negative patients, so they could be triple negative or ER positive, and there was a survival advantage for the earlier use of this. So that would be, you know, of course that's a subset analysis. The overall trial did not have survival advantage, but it, it really made the point that probably getting this into the earlier lines of therapy might really have well, the, the greatest certain, impact. Certainly that the neoadjuvant talizoprib data would, would be consistent with that theme, that early exposure could be a, could yes. be a, a real positive. It was a small trial, but the, the PAF-CR rate with just single agent talizoprib was like 60% or something like this, was re remarkable, just, just right up there with you know, a platinum-based um, uh, regimen. So yeah, pretty, um, that's a nice, nice, nice option for patients, certainly. So, so